to another edition of Pure Picks. Joined here by Mad Top G Gerard. How are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing well. Can't can't wait for these long stretch of UFC fights, so I'm ready. Yeah, dude, let's get it, man. Well, before we hop into the next event, which is gonna be the Elite Safe versus Imavov, I wanted to go over a few plays that we had. On the last card, UFC 297, um, we did not do great. Ended up being negative units on the day for our bet MMA tip plays, which is something that not good, not something that we don't want to have as far as going in the red. We do want to go over some of those plays just so you can kind of see how they went and how they played out, our thought process there. First off, let's... Well, good news first, because I'm always a, a positive guy. Um, DDP, Sean Strickland put a unit on that as far as his money line. Admittedly, that was a pretty close bout. Uh, a lot of people have it, you know, 48, 47, either way, I think. Uh, there's some really close rounds there, so I'm not going to toot our own horn too much on that play, because I think that that fight could have gone either direction, but Glad that we were on the right side. DDP, if anything, he proved that. I think he was a championship-level fighter, at least, because he had a really close bout with another championship-level fighter, Sean Strickland. So a win is a win at the end of the day, and we'll take it. And for the other one, it was Sam Patterson, Moneyline, half a unit. That was a good read also by us, but we kind of negated that by putting <laughs> Half a unit uh, plus 800 on Sam Patterson money uh, decision. Um, and yeah, in, in the future, I think that that's something that we probably would just say, hey, let's just go with the money line because, you know, plus 800 doesn't hit that often. Um, and you can kind of see what happened there. I mean, that that kind of negated the, the money line play. We did end up getting 0.1 units, I mean, which isn't too bad, but still at the end of the day, I think that that's something that we'll take into account for the future as well. I wanted to really talk about this one because I'm I'm pretty sad that we're on this side of the um, Mike Malott train here. Uh, you know, he he won. I think he was up on two judges, uh, all judges scorecards on first two rounds. Last round had the worst fight IQ I've seen in a while, and his gas tank just disappeared all of a sudden. Pulled guillotine, uh, yeah, not not a good recipe there. And unfortunately, we fell into the same trap of a very similar trap of the Gabriel Bonfim versus um, Nicholas Dalby, where we backed a fighter with unproven cardio, unproven gas tank against a vet. And, I mean, props to Magni; he's a vet. He still was able to have the sense to win the fight, even though he was down. And yeah, just major props to Neil Magny. I mean, he, he proved us all wrong there. If we did hit that Mike Malott play, though, we would have ended up in the green. So very close to the green day, but nonetheless, ended up with a loss on that. And it negated our over two and a half Arnold Allen, Mozart, Evoyed fight as well. And yeah, Jar, you can go over uh, the other parlay that you had. Yeah, this parlay, Siri CD and Charles Jordan. I remember I said that this wasn't my most confident card, and I ended up parlaying uh, Siri City, who I thought I actually thought he won that fight. I think he dropped yeah, the exactly. ball in that first round, then he got cut up, so maybe that stained the later rounds for him. But he kept pressuring throughout the second and third round, so yeah, that was that was a tough one there. Charles Jordan versus Sean Woodson. I knew this could have been uh, pretty hard for Charles Jourdain to reach, to have that uh, length disadvantage and reaching him. But yeah, I just thought that Jourdain would be a little bit more dangerous and more aggressive. But yeah, when, <laughs> they raised his hand at first, but <laughs> apparently they gave it to Woodson. So yeah, that one was a loss. Surprisingly enough, my, the only other two lower uh underdogs that i picked on the whole card was uh was jimmy flick and garrett armfield but i didn't 
I didn't have the guts to put it on this uh, MMA bet tips, but yeah, I think we'll do better on the next one though. Just for full disclosure, I was pushing for Jimmy Flick <laughs> when he when Gerard pitched it. I was like, why not just do it, man? Yeah. Just do it. But um, yeah, maybe next time I'll I'll use it as like a decision on that one myself <laughs> to, to put mm. through something like that. But yeah, uh, I mean, not not too bad overall. I mean, you know, negative unit is something that we don't want to have, but you know, at least it wasn't one of those days where it blows up your account. So we'll move on to the next one and strive to just move forward and continue to get consistent gains going forward. Now, talking about the you know next fight night, the Elite Sapers involved this Saturday. I think that there are going to be some spots that could potentially be a good plays. I see a lot of fights going to decision in this fight card, so I think that's going to be a, a running theme for me personally. We'll see how it plays out on actual fight night, but I think that there's going to be a few spots that could be good plays. Let's just start off. So the first fight on the prelims is going to be Thomas Peterson versus Jamal Pogues. I think that this is going to be a fight, maybe not the highest level fight, but I think it's going to be a decent fight um, nonetheless. Now, Thomas Peterson, the train, I believe that this is going to be his UFC debut. Um, he is 8-1 and one right now, 4-1 in his last five. I think he's coming off the Contender Series win where he pulled off a submission, I believe. And as far as uh, Jamal Pogues, he is 10-4, 3-2 and, four, three and two in his last five. He's coming off that loss against Mick Parson, Parkins. Right now, Jamal Pogues and Thomas Peterson. Thomas Peterson is actually the minus 163 favorite, opened up at a minus 270. So some dog action has been taken on Jamal Pogues there. Gerard, I'll let you go ahead and start off the breakdown for this prelim fight. What do you think about Thomas Peterson versus Jamal Pogues? So this fight, these heavyweights, um, Thomas Peterson... He looks pretty. He looks pretty patient on the feet, and he's, he doesn't seem to rush things. And for a heavyweight, this guy he looks like he really has some serious, uh, real wrestling pressure. Something that Jamal Pogues I don't think he has seen in his recent fights. Um, Jamal Pogues he he probably has the striking advantage. And he likes to just stick and move a little bit. But watching his striking, he doesn't look that dangerous. He doesn't have like that devastating pop or power, it seems. And one of his fights, I think it was Contender Series, he was facing a 220-pound fighter. And he was even getting held up against a cage by a smaller guy. And the smaller guy wasn't giving him um pogues that much respect so i don't know if pogues will be able to keep thomas pearson from pressuring him and wrestling him from the striking aspect so i see why thomas pearson is a slight favorite here so yeah um my pick here is pearson low confidence on these heavyweights but yeah that's my pick here Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a similar view of how the fight's going to go down, but I, I think I'm going the other direction, but kind of similar views. Uh, Thomas Peterson, see wrestler, he's a heavyweight, but, you know, not the biggest frame for the division. Um, his frame kind of reminds me at times of like a Jake Collier in a way. Um, mm -hmm. He, you know, good wrestler. I think he can shoot for takedowns. Well-versed in a lot of body lock takedowns as well. And I believe that he also has some good ground to pound once on top. I think that he's just an okay striker, though. I mean, he has a bit of pop on the shots, but mainly he uses his you know basic straights. He can dirty box it well as well, fight in the pocket and in the clinch. I think that he does most of the time keep his chin protected, but he does go in reckless at times when he sees an opening, especially if he wants to go in for a takedown. And I think that he also relies on the durability and the chin as well for him. He does have unproven cardio. We have not seen him have a decision so far in his career. I think that the only fight that he was KO'd 
so far was when he went to round three and it was all almost the near end of the fight and he got knocked out by Waldo Cortez Acosta on uh, not in the UFC but prior to the UFC. Jamal Pogues, actually I think he's pretty well rounded, shown to have average skills in wrestling and striking. He's able to use his strength and size to drag opponents down to the ground. I also think that he surprisingly scrambles well for a fighter his size. Good ground control, top control. He does use boxing mainly as a striking base. You know, pumps out some good volume for heavyweight. Good jab as well. He does leave his chin exposed at times, so he can get hit. The thing that I do like about Pogues is that he does have proven cardio in UFC bouts. All of his UFC bouts so far have ended in decision. He is 5-1. and one in career decision victories or record. And overall, though, I, I believe that this will be a sloppy heavyweight fight and Pokes will sneak out a decision based on his proven cardio. I think that he'll sprawl and brawl his way to a victory. I would recommend waiting until weigh-ins if you're going to be on the Pokes side because he did show, out, show up pretty out of shape in his last fight and against Mick Parkins. And it was really noticeable if you see a before and after picture of him on the scales in the Parkins fight compared to his other fights. And I think that affected his cardio in a major way. And Mick Parkins was just able to outlast, outgun him pretty much in a three-round fight. So if Pokes looks great on the scale, I think he's the side here. My pick here is going to be Pokes by decision. Like Gerard, though, I believe that this is a low-confidence pick for me. I do like the over one and a half minus two forty as a potential parlay piece, but let's go wait and see how Pokes looks and you know how Peterson looks as well. But if they both look great, looks like they're you know have good cardio for the fight. I think that the over one and a half could be a good play there. Moving on to the next fight, we have Markel Medeiros versus Landon Quinones. This will be a fight in the lightweight division here. Now, Markel Medeiros, he's 8-1 in, the, uh, in, in his career. He's 5-0 in his last five. He's coming off of that knee KO versus Issa Eskov in the Dana White Contender Series. He's fighting against Landon Quinones, 7-2-1. He is 4-1 in his last five, coming off that decision loss against Nazrat Haparas. Right now, the odds for this fight, Markel Medeiros is actually a minus 128, opened up at a minus 220. So a lot of dog action has been taken on Landis Quinones so far. You know, Landis Quinones and Markel Medeiros, I, I think this is going to be extremely uh, interesting fight here. I think both of these guys are actually decent prospects for the lightweight division. Uh, Medeiros, I think he's also I mean, well-rounded. He showed some good striking skills in his Dana White Contender Series fight. He's able to rack up combos pretty quickly. He's able to really show some power as well. I think that the thing that I like about him is that it looks a little unorthodox, but he can fight from either orthodox or southpaw, constantly switches stances, which is something that I like. Uses feints and fakes to keep his opposition guessing. He does keep his hands low at times, so this can be either a positive or a negative. You know, he can explode from unique angles when he does this or get caught if he doesn't pull his guard up. I think that Markel's grappling is also something that's pretty interesting. You know, he stuffed all eight of the takedown attempts in his last fight against um, the Dana White Tender Series fight. And he was able to get back up and then just impose his will on the opposition. I think that he's also good at using his strength to just push opponents in the cage and then he can also work in takedowns from there from his side he also likes to move forward and pressure throughout the fight and also like that he has he seems to have good cardio um he doesn't slow down much in later rounds he's two and one in decisions in his career landon is also a well-rounded fighter is able to strike and grapple likes to also pressure forward those strikes to all three levels the head body and the legs Really good leg kicks, actually. If you looked at his fight against Nazrat, he was lighting up Nazrat's legs in that fight. Good body kicks as well. He's also able to work in the hands with boxing combos, 
but main I think that he's he's more so a better uh, kicker than a, a boxer. Landon also has good wrestling skills. I mean, he didn't really show that in his last loss against Nazrat, but from previous bouts, he has good takedowns, able to shoot for single, double legs, able to work to the cage and find the clinch, dirty box as well. He stuffed all five of Nazareth's takedowns, so I think both of these guys have pretty good takedown defense. Landon has proven cardio. I mean, he is, in the UFC at least, he has survived his UFC debut against a proven talent like Nazareth. However, he is one and two in decision in his career, so he's more so losing when he gets the judge scorecard. I think that this will be a close fight. Both fighters have well-rounded skill sets. I will side with Markel here, just edging out decision victory with his superior ability to land higher impact shots. I think that he has a little bit more pop and power in his shots. So Markel, by decision, will be my pick. Most likely, though, I'm staying away from this fight as it could be close, and I don't have that type of confidence in either fighter. The over two and a half at plus 100 could be a solid prop play, but we'll see how that goes um, later on in the week, see if we decide to make that official play. Gerard, what do you think about Markel versus Landon here? Yeah, I think this is going to be a good fight. I I do like uh, Markel Medeiros, his the way he moves. He's kind of loose with it. I like his, uh, he has, he's more of a dynamic striker and he, he switches stance pretty fluidly and he has, yeah, like you said, the wilder, more explosive strikes that can finish fights. So I think he is the more dangerous fighter here. As for Landon, I like his volume and the way he mixes up his, uh, striking targets he goes high and he goes low he was giving Hasprat problems with those leg kicks and yeah he 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 looks he looked really good in in that loss and um he has that quality experience under his belt going up against a hot pros for three rounds now one thing to question here for Medeiros is if he can match the pace and the volume of Landon if he can't get Landon out of there for three rounds to see if his cardio will hold up in that pace and that volume. So I think that's also one thing that made the lines move is because we we don't that's an unknown kind of for a Maderos to face someone like Landon's pace and volume. And me personally, I think this fight can actually go the distance. And I already I already have a bet on the over two and a half for this fight. But originally I was gonna pick Markel Maderos in this one, but I think I'm just gonna be a low confidence in Maderos and I don't think I'll I'll play a bet on either side. Just the over two and a half, I think, for this fight for me. Nice. I'm glad that we're on the same side. I mean, um, I just looked over the odds right now on Bet Online. Over two and a half is now minus one twenty five. So last time that I looked at it, it was plus a hundred, and you know, I guess it's moving mm-hmm. that direction now. So yeah, maybe that's a good prop to attack, unless you know it, it might fly off to even a heavier juice price. So get that in there while it's good. Next fight that we have on the prelim still, it is going to be a women's MMA bout. Julia Starenko versus Leona Carolina. Uh, Julia, obviously, she is uh, coming off of that submission victory over Molly McCann. You know, she's 11, 7, and 1, 2, and 3 in her last five. She's facing off against Luana Carolina, 9, and 4. She is 3, and 2 in her last five, coming off that decision victory over Ivana Petrovic. Both fighters around the same age, uh, so and also have, have the similar dimensions as well. Odds for this fight right now, Julia Storenko, she opened up at a plus 130, actually. And now she has been bet to a minus 130 favorite. So people instantly took the dog odds on Julia and made her a slight favorite over the course of about a few weeks there. Gerard, I'll let you go ahead and take over uh, this breakdown first off. What do you think about Julia versus Luana here? Nothing like my favorite low-level women's MMA. So (laughs) 
Julia. All right, Julia is more of a specialist here. She's looking for that submission. And I don't think she's that great of a fighter, but she she is that dangerous with that uh specialist uh work skill set that she has. As for Luana, she's gonna have the advantage in the striking, but like she she's not that dangerous even in the striking i see she's kind of like more of a decision fighter or a point fighter in terms of the striking she doesn't show that much power or pop so in a in a fight where it's hard to trust money on both fighters i'll i'm probably going to lean towards the more dangerous fighter and that would be Julia in this in this fight with her submission. So that would be my low confidence pick in this woman's MMA fight. But I'm probably going to stay away. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I agree with you almost to the T there. I mean, Julia's grappler, good sub skills. She's proven that throughout his career. She mainly uses judo throws and trips to land the takedowns instead of shooting for those wrestling takedowns. But once she is on top... I think she's actually extremely dangerous and arm bars are the, the main submission that she uses. Doesn't have the best striking technique though. I mean, I think that she is a bit sloppy with her shots. She does have some power in the shots though when they land. Um, likes to use those kicks as well. So she, I think she does have power. She pressures forward as well. Luana is a Muay Thai fighter. Good striking skills. I think she pumps out some good volume. She really likes to use the Thai clinch. Landing elbows, knees in the clinch. But she can also strike in range as well. She has a solid 76% take, takedown defense. Once she is taken down, though, she does have a tendency to be controlled on her back. I think this fight's actually pretty simple. I, mean, I believe that the fight will play in favor of Julia, as both fighters like to fight in that close, close range in the clinch. And this will lead to Julia just being able to implement some of her trips and throws. I think she will be able to use top control and just will potentially find a sub or maybe even ride out uh, Carolina for a decision. My pick here is Julia by submission or decision. It is low confidence, though, as I do not trust Julia's overall skill level yet. Most likely, I'm probably staying away from this fight. Moving on to the next fight, and this is going to be an interesting fight as well. We have Blake Builder versus Jin Young Lee. And this fight right now, I mean, Blake Builder, he's 8-1-1. and one and one. He's coming off of that decision loss to uh, Kyle Nelson, where I think he was a, actually a pretty decent-sized favorite. He's 4-1 in his last five. He's fighting against Jin, Jin Young Lee, 10-1. and one. He's 5-0 in his last five, coming off of that close split decision victory over Yiza. Lee will be the younger fighter here by about five years. And just in terms of frame, he'll be the slightly bigger fighter. Odds for this fight right now, Jung Young Lee, minus 144. Opened up at minus 255 favorite. So a lot of uh, dog action has kind of been taken on Blake Builder so far. You know, I, this this is a kind of a tricky fight to predict, in, in my opinion. I, I think that Builder, he's you know all round fighter. I think mainly though, he's a wrestler and grappler. Despite his performances in the UFC, you know he has like a ten percent takedown accuracy. He has shown to have an aggressive wrestling skill set. I think that his takedowns are okay. Um, he likes to take the back of his opposition, sink and chokes from there. Has shown a one hundred percent takedown defense in the UFC though, although he has faced mainly strikers thus far. So. Maybe not the best stat to pull up here. Now, Blake striking is able to throw power shots, get to 50-50 exchanges. He likes to take one to give one. This is really evident in his uh, striking ratio. Lands 4.96 strikes per minute. And then he absorbs 4.54 strikes. So kind of 50-50 ratio there. Lee is a solid all-around fighter. He likes to get into brawls. 
and he really just brawls his way into victories most of the time. Throws heavy shots, wants to create wild exchanges. He's able to fight in the clinch and land solid uppercuts while taking down his opponent. He does prefer to use his hands mainly. I think his submission skills are pretty good. He's more of a Brazilian jiu-jitsu grappler than wrestler, though. He likes to wait for those opportunistic takedowns, you know, throw heavy, and then just get the fight to the ground off his brawling. Prefers to use the armbar. All four sub victories in his career so far have been arm bars. He's also threatened the arm bar in his last split decision win. I think he has a decent 73% takedown defense. He defended five of 21 takedowns in his last fight. However, once he was taken down, though, he was controlled for about eight minutes. You know, I, I think that this fight will come down to whose chin and gas tank goes out first. I will side with Lee as Builder's striking defense and Lee's ability to perform well in brawls may lead to Lee cracking Builder at some point and getting a club and sub. So my pick here is Lee by sub. It's also going to be low confidence, though, so I'm staying away from this fight. Gerard, what are your thoughts between Builder and Lee here? Yeah, in terms of skill-wise, all around, they might be pretty evenly matched, I think. The one thing good going for Builder here is he does have that athleticism and his size for this division. And that might play a factor here. But especially in his last fight, he doesn't seem to have the greatest uh, adjustments. He kind of just keeps going how he's going, even if he's struggling. So it's hard to pick a fighter who doesn't adjust throughout a fight. As for Jung Young Lee, he is light on his feet, solid striking. This could end up being a close fight. And to me, it looks like Jung Young Lee, he kind of fights through the adversity a little bit more from what I've seen. And he doesn't just, he's not just uh, content at being in a bad position. And he was able to get that split decision win against a wrestler in his last fight, able to put on the damage in that fight for the most part in those uh, brawling exchanges. So, and he's he'll have the longer reach in this one too. And I think he might be the more, more loose, longer fighter here. So I kind of like that going up against Builder here. So I'm at a low confidence here for Jung Young Lee, as long as he's able to get away from too much of the grappling with the size of Blake Builder here. And yeah, that's my pick here. Low confidence, Jung Young Lee. Awesome, awesome. Moving on to the next fight, we have Themba Grimbo versus Pete Rodriguez. This will be a fight in the welterweight division after Pete's well uh, kind of, I think he, he tried to cut to lightweight and then he had to pull out against Natan Levy in the past. Now Themba Grimbo, He's 11 and 4, 3 and 2 in his last five. He is coming off that decision victory over Takashi Sato. A pretty dominating decision victory, actually. He is uh, fighting against Pete Rodriguez, 5 and 1. And Pete is 4 and 1 in his last five, coming off of that KO victory over Mike Jackson, who, not the greatest UFC talent there. Now, Pete will be the younger fighter here, but Grimbo will be the just taller fighter and have the reach advantage as well. Pete, Garim, uh, Pete uh, Rodriguez, he's a plus 210 underdog. So, you know, Garimbo, he actually opened up at a minus 350. And now he has been bet to a minus 250. So some dog action has been taken on Pete Rodriguez. And Gerard, uh, I'll let you start off this breakdown as well. What do you think about Garimbo versus Rodriguez here? This fight here, Garimbo, he looks like the more well-rounded fighter. I mean, he has more tape on him. We're not so sure on Pete Rodriguez is uh, grappling as much. He hasn't been there too many UFC rounds yet. So 
for Garimbo, I mean, we've seen his striking. He uses that length, but still in the grappling or striking, I'm still not overly impressed by Thembo Garimbo. He seems like he gets positions, but he also gives away positions as well quite often. And in this fight, I can see he could possibly get caught here against a Pete Rodriguez who kind of shows some a little bit of that brawling bruiser style. And against his fight against uh, Jack Della Maddalena, he, he looked okay. He looked okay out there against JDM up until uh, JDM finish, finished him. And yeah, JDM's just at a different level, but Pete Rodriguez looked pretty competent out there on the stand-up. And I think that uh, Pete Rodriguez may be able to find a finish if he turns this into a fight and a brawling in the stand-up. And he, he goes for those short bursts and catches Garimbo just standing there. So uh i'm i'm leaning i'm leaning pete rodriguez here i think he's just more dangerous and bemba garimbo i i'm just not sold on garimbo's what skill set and uh garimbo i'm just not yeah i'm just not overly impressed by garimbo basically so yeah my pick here is pete rodriguez possible upset nice are, are you confident enough in him putting him as like maybe a, a dog play because those odds are pretty juicy right now i think plus 210 as a dog play possibly but i think i i want to see the face-offs i think he is coming off of a this is a short notice as well i think for Pete. yes so i kind of want to see how he looks for sure. Yeah, I mean, Themba is, you know, he's a range striker, likes to use his grappling to keep his opponents guessing. 77 inch reach, though, so uses his range to his advantage. Good kicks, things more so of a kicker than a, like a puncher. Likes to counter as well, is able to pressure forward. I think that Themba showed some good grappling ability in his last win against Sato. He landed three out of eight takedowns. Controlled Sato for 11 minutes, and he was able to land some ground and pound once on top. I think he also knocked down Sato once or twice in that fight as well. Uh, Pete, powerful striker. He likes to move forward at all times. You know, true brawler. Likes to you know hunt his opponents. Takes one to give one approach as well, so just definitely a brawler. He's also somewhat durable, uh, especially considering his fighting style, however... You know, we saw what a high level boxer like JDM did to him when he was cracked by him. So that style won't get too far, especially in the UFC. But he does like to fight at a fast pace and just try to end the fight quickly. And, you know, right now, just to tell you guys, the over round line is over one and a half. So people think that this, and the under one and a half is minus 125. So people think that this fight might end pretty quickly, either according to the odds right now, either by a Garimbo sub or a Pete KO. I think that Pete will attempt to pressure Themba, especially early in the fight. Themba will wait for Pete to come and possibly counter him, staying on the outside with his range and then working the takedown to swing the fight in his favor. So right now, Themba by decision or sub, more likely sub, I'm probably going to hold off on this for now, wait until Themba maybe becomes a little bit more affordable as a potential parlay piece, because I, I am on his side, because I think that he will just take Pete down with his size and grappling ability. But, like you mentioned, I mean, Pete is a very dangerous striker. Themba could easily get caught by KO while trying to go for some of these takedowns or trying to get into these grappling exchanges. So, holding off on Garimba right now, and I'll wait until how the you know face-offs wanes look because, as you mentioned as well, Pete Rodriguez is coming off of a uh, late notice here for sure. Moving on to the next fight, we have Charles Johnson versus Azat Maxim. Charles Johnson, I mean the energy himself, 
He is 13 and 6 right now. He is coming off of a uh, loss to uh, Rafael Estevam. And I mean, right now he's he's three, two and three in his last five. So he's coming off of three straight losses in the UFC. So he's looking to get that momentum back into his favor in this fight. As at maximum 17 and 0. He is 5-0 in his last five, coming off that close to the decision victory over Tyson Nam. He will be obviously the younger fighter. Both of them have the same dimensions, although Charles Johnson will have a two-inch height advantage here. Odds for this fight right now, Charles Johnson and Azad Maxim. Azad is a minus 210, opened up at a minus 300. So some dog action has been taken on energy. You know, Charles, mostly active striker, relies on the technique and pace to push out a decision win most of the time. I don't think he has the best takedown defense, but he can work himself back up and can survive grappling exchanges. He has never been subbed. However, he does have a tendency of being controlled for the majority of the 15 minutes. This was seen in the Cody Durden loss, where Cody Durden just chain wrestled him to death seen in his last loss against Rafael. I mean, Charles Johnson did great in the third round, but first two rounds, he was just thoroughly outgrappled and controlled. On the feet, Charles can keep his striking pace for all 15 minutes, even after working his way back up from a takedown. Charles has probably below average power, but he relies more on his quick hands and just, you know, rather than the pure power. His only KOs usually come later, I mean, 38% of his wins are KOs. Outside of a quick KO of a watch, Jimmy Flick, I mean, he's mainly a decision fighter. Now, Azat, I think he's a good striker and grappler. He likes to mix it up to get the win. Good movement on the feet. Quick straight strikes. I think he does have power in his hands. Um, if I remember correctly, he, I think he um, stunned. Tyson Nam will potentially even like almost knock him down. So he does have some good power in his hands. Good chin as well, durability. And his grappling, although he didn't show too much in the grappling department in his last fight, he is able to shoot for takedowns constantly, has a high volume grappling and takedown pace. Like I mentioned, he did struggle against Tyson Nam. He only landed two out of 11 takedowns. However, Tyson Nam... People need to look into this guy. I mean, he has an 87% takedown defense as opposed to 62% takedown defense for Johnson. Even when Azad did take him down, he wasn't able to control Tyson for too long. So I, I think that Tyson is a different fighter than Charles Johnson even. So I believe that Azad will just follow the pl blueprint to defeat Johnson and just grapple his way to victory. I mean, Johnson has shown to just constantly lose this style this fight could play out similar to Ode versus Charles a close split decision either way I do think that Azat will grind out a decision victory however I actually like the over two and a half here more as a potential parlay piece and right now it's minus 265 so I actually like that play as, as I'll, I'll rather play that than side with Azat because I think that this could be similar to the whole day Charles Johnson fight where it's a close split decision. Gerard, what do you think about Azat versus Energy here? Yeah, th this fight, I think I've been backing Charles Johnson too much. <laughs> as <a boy. laughs> I mean, this is uh, this guy, Energy, man, he, he's, he fights better than his record. <laughs> Because his his talent, he's more skilled than what his record shows. So I think he's going to be the better striker here, twitchy. He can have the volume in terms of mixing it up with his hands low. And he he could dance on people. I mean, he almost, he could have finished Estevam in that third round <laughs> had he m more power. and. He, the energy just came out too late and he, he needs to start he needs to start early have that energy come out in the first round but yeah he, I mean he struggles with these grapplers and Azat Maxim 
he's undefeated he's he could just go go for wrestling here throughout the whole fight but i wasn't too overly impressed with his grappling against tyson nam but like you said tyson nam might actually be pretty formidable takedown defense um but i i think azat can easily get outstruck in this fight if it stays on the feet and this could end up being like a close fight maybe even another split decision with the veteran veteran charles johnson looking to change his record against grapplers here now that he's lost to so many already i'm I would think he would make some adjustments here against Azat. So, but I mean, you can't really bank on that happening because we always see time and time again. I keep picking Charles Johnson, and he keeps doing the same thing over and over again, even even with how skilled he is. So, so I'm still gonna pick Charles Johnson. <laughs> Charles Johnson in this one, but it's a low confidence. But I'm probably gonna stay away and just watch this. Uh, I'll make I might look at the over two and a half, but yeah, I'm picking Charles Johnson again. But yeah, <laughs> that's how I see this fight. Awesome, awesome. Well, yeah, hopefully he made some adjustments. Um, also, another thing to note is that he is coming in on short notice, replacing Nate Menace. So. Um, I don't know. This guy likes to take a lot of short notice fights, so we'll, we'll see what happens with him. Uh, mm -hmm. Next fight that we have, this is going to be the feature prelim of the night. Molly McCann versus Diana Belbita. Molly Meatball McCann, 13-6. She is 3-2 and two in her last five. She's coming off two straight losses, and her last loss was a, a submission armbar loss to Julia Sterlenko. I think that she, I remember she was the heavy favorite in that fight, too, so yeah, she kind of sold in England last time. She's kind of fighting against Diana Belbita, fifteen and eight. She is three, uh, two and three in her last five, and she's coming off that decision loss to Carolina Kolobitwajic. And right now, Diana is actually the younger fighter here by about six years, and she's going to be obviously the slightly larger fighter as well. Fight odds right now: Molly McCann is a minus two eighty. And um, I believe that she was actually even a bigger favorite. Yeah. Oh, actually, yeah. So she opened up at a minus 155, then bet to a minus 280. And uh, last night when I checked, she was about like a minus 300. So some dog action has been taken, but mainly people are taking the Molly Meatball McCann side. And th this might be just because, I mean, th this is actually a rematch. Um, if you look at their records, they actually fought... Uh, in 2019, I believe, and Molly McCann actually had like a 30-25 on all three judges' scorecards in that fight. So people might think that the you know, same thing might happen here in this fight. I'll start off with this. I mean, Molly McCann. I actually think that she's a uh, you know decent striker, aggressive striker, likes to pressure and bully her opponents. You know, good power. Good volume and output in her strikes. Likes to work in the pocket. Mainly, she's a headhunter, so could be a disadvantage because you know a lot of the new generation of kind of MMA kind of try to attack legs, body, and the head. But she's mainly a headhunter. I think that her grappling is okay, actually. You know, she's able to work in takedowns offensively, at least. You know, able to work in takedowns as she pressures the opponents to the cage and use cage takedowns. Once she's on top, she's able to rain down ground pound. Now, the negative of her grappling is that she has very little jiu-jitsu skills, and this leads to her having very horrible sub-submission defense. Now, Diana is an offensively technical striker, has a decent jab, pumps out high volume. She also likes to pressure forward and relies on her chin and durability, just eating shots. Her grappling, I think that she can threaten off her back, she does have a decent arm bar, but she is usually held down once taken down. And she does not have the best submission defense herself. As I mentioned, this is a rematch of the 2019 bout where Molly 30-25 Diana on all three judge scorecards. 
Molly was able to just dominate that matchup, and I see Molly winning again due to her edge and power, and Diana's lack of submission ability, which is Molly's weakness. My pick here is Molly by decision. I could see a KO, maybe, if Diana wilts under some of that pressure, but Molly by decision is my pick. I actually like the over one and a half at minus 240. It looks appealing and a potential parlay piece for me. Gerard, what do you think about Meatball versus Diana Belbita here? Yeah, for this rematch, this is going to be at a straw weight instead of a flyweight from their last fight. So I think this might be Molly McCann's first go at straw weight, and it, it'll be a rematch here. She's already beaten Deanna once, but that was a younger Diana Belbita. And I think uh, Deanna's probably gotten much better than her lap than in the past. And Molly McCann is getting older and we don't really see her getting much better. So the question is if Deanna has been able to close the gap and the wild card if Molly McCann will look good in this lower weight class. So Molly McCann's going to be a, the, the dangerous fighter. She's got dangerous hands. And I, I think she'll she'll have the more damaging blows. But Belbita, she's a little bit more technical. She throws some volume, but she doesn't really show me too much threat in the danger factor is in her striking so this fight i'm gonna lean molly mccann in the rematch but i think there's upset potential here for deanna getting the get back in molly mccann molly mccann has been has shown to uh to lose as a favorite in the past so yeah, I'm probably going to stay away. Belbita might get some action later in the week, but I'm not sure yet. So McCann's going to be my pick for now, but I'm probably going to stay away. What, what do you think about the over one and a half? Is it too good to be true? Because you usually don't see that in a women's MMA belt. Uh, over one and a half. Yeah. Well, what is the odds for that? Minus 240. Minus 240? Uh, over one seems somewhat trappy. I don't know. Maybe it's a trap. <laughs> maybe, maybe they see a Belbita sub early or a yes. Molly McCann KO early or something. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it does seem too good to be true because usually you don't see those odds for women's MMA. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. but we'll see. I mean, it opened up at minus two ten, and it's been bet to minus two forty. So. DJs are already trying to pound that uh, right off the bat. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm probably going to include that in my parlays, honestly. I feel like it is uh, mm -hmm. too good to be true, but hey, sometimes you just got to play the odds, play the system. Let's move on to the next fight. We're going to be in the main card now. And uh, this is going to be the fight that opens up the main card. So, we have Gilbert Urbina versus Charles Radke. Gilbert Urbina, 7-2. He's 3-2 in his last five, coming off of that KO victory over Orion Kose. Charles Racky, 8-3. He's actually 5-0 and in his last five, coming off of that decision victory over Blood Diamond. Charles Racky is actually 33 years old, so he's actually uh, older than Gilbert Urbina. is 27, but Gilbert will be the taller fighter here and have a reach advantage. Gilbert Urbina is a minus 200 right now. Opened up at a minus 155. And he actually was at one point bet to a plus 130. So a lot of wild movement, line movement for this fight. Gerard, I'll let you start off the main card breakdown here. What do you think about Urbina versus Raggy? Yeah, this one, I'm I'm going to be picking Gilbert Urbina here. I think overall, he's just the more dangerous and better fighter. But I do think Radke's probably probably the more high higher IQ fighter. 
I mean, in his last fight, it was underwhelming against Blood Diamond. He couldn't really take down Blood Diamond that much. And I'm a little suspicious that Radke, that was probably not the best Radke showing. So he's probably much better than that. But again, I think the size and athleticism of Urbina and the youth mixed in with just the resume of experience that Urbina has shown in his past fights, even through losses. I'm more impressed by Urbina than I am for Charles Radke. Now that Radke's 33, I, I see a path where Urbina can possibly blast through Radke in this fight. And Radke, Radke may have that submission threat, maybe find Urbina's back. But I think for me, I'm just I'm gonna side with the, the more dangerous guy here, the one who's been in there with with quality UFC opponents. So my pick here is Gilbert Urbina. I think the size just might be too much for Charles Radke in this one. So that's that's my medium confidence pick on this fight. Yeah, I was going back and forth on this fight um, myself. Gilbert is a solid fighter. I think that he's actually just all offense, though, and just very little defense. So he pumps out a nice pace on the feet. He has below average striking defense, though. I mean, his striking defense is 47%. So he definitely pumps out a high volume, has a 60% striking accuracy, but he takes in a lot of shots as well. He does have a good ratio, though. He lands 6.33 strikes per minute and absorbs 4.09. So at least his strikes landed is higher than the strikes absorbed. His grappling is similar, though. I mean, he's a solid offensive wrestler, does a good job mixing in the strikes with the takedowns, but his takedown defense is actually below average as well. I think that you know, in this fight, that that could be a problem just because Charles, he's mainly a wrestler who likes to pressure forward and he's a good grappler overall. I think he's able to transition to dominant positions quickly. He does have submissions in his toolbox. He's able to stick to the game plan and shoot for takedowns, grind against the cage and in the clinch. And it's really, he just has a grinder kind of game plan and mindset, right? He commits to it. So I think that that could be an issue for Gilbert here. Now, his striking, Charles, he likes to advance forward. He does have power in his hands, some good hooks, uppercuts, those kind of strikes. I think that his striking defense is also below average, and he likes to weather storms and use his durability. So, I mean, I think that the obviously should be probably a little bit closer in, in this fight. I will say that I think Gilbert will win, but... I'm just not confident either fighter to actually make a high confidence prediction. So I'm probably going to stay away from this fight. Pick here is Gilbert inside the distance. But I'm, I'm most likely to stay away from this fight here. All right. Next fight that we have on the main card is going to be Alyeskov Kizriev versus Mahmoud Muradov. Kizriev is 14-0. He's 5-0 in his last five. He's coming off that submission victory over Dennis Talulin. That was out almost two years ago, so it's been a kind of a long time since he last fought, actually. He is fighting against Mahmoud Maradov, 26-8. and eight. He is 3-2 in his last five, coming off that dominating decision victory over Brian Barberina. Both of these fighters are around the same age. However, Mahmoud will be the taller fighter and have a slight reach advantage. Kizriev is actually a minus 155 favorite right now. He opened up at a minus 225 and was actually bet to an underdog at one point. But uh, he has since settled to a minus 155 favorite. So some dog action has been taken on Mahmoud. Right now, Gerard, I'll let you start off this breakdown. What do you think about Kizriev versus Muradov here? Yeah, so Kizriev. I don't know if uh, people have been 
ducking him because he hasn't been that active as of late and he's already 33. Um, he might have pr- probably maybe the better grappling versus Mahmoud, but Mahmoud is no slouch, slouch as well in terms of the grappling. Um, his Riv, I think he's pretty sneaky. He has some sneaky good striking, but he does look hittable and Tolulian was able to hit him with some nice shots in that fight. So Mahmoud might have some 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 good shots to get in there. Um, I think Mahmoud, he's pretty solid everywhere. He has nice kicks, good wrestling. And I actually think he looked pretty good against Kyle. And Kyle's a pretty good grappler himself. He's in He's a contender in this division. And I like the quality of experience that Mahmoud has, and he's been the more active fighter. Kizriev, I guess he kind of has that uh, scariness about him. I mean, is he Dagestani or he's kind of have, he has like that, that type of vibe, but He's undefeated, and I'm not sure if his resume has really tested him as much. He might have just been fighting some lower-level fighters. I'm not sure, but Mahmoud is going to be a real test, I think. And Mahmoud as a dog in this fight, I think I'm going to lean Mahmoud Muradov in this one. I think he's just the more experienced guy here, and he's... He also has the wrestling, and I think Mahmoud can switch it up some more. The only thing that he has to avoid is uh, Kizriev possibly getting his back or getting into too much submission threats. I think Mahmoud just needs to keep Kizriev in, in distance and have the more dominating, dominant uh, wrestling positions. So my pick here is Mahmoud, and I'm going to lean on experience in this one. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, Kizri, a well-rounded fighter, mainly uses wrestling, though, more often than not. He likes to move forward and strike with high volume, able to chain together hands and kicks. So he does a good job mixing in both of those strikes. He's also a good wrestler, as I mentioned, able to just attack takedowns using single double legs high volume ground and pound once on top solid submission skills has some pretty nice chokes as well Muradov is another well-rounded fighter who uses striking or wrestling depending on his opponent's weaknesses he likes to stay at range and counter with accurate shots has a wide variety of strikes he can use kicks knees he showed some solid wrestling skills, mainly in his last win against Barbarina and landed 13 takedowns. However, he only controlled Barbarina for five minutes. So I think that once Muradov is able to shoot for takedowns and once he's on top, he can land ground pound as well. Both of these fighters' gas tank seem to be an issue. From what I've seen, I think that they have shown to just have less in volume and pace later on in the fight. I do believe that Kizriev will prove to just be the more dominant wrestler, and I think he's just going to turn this into a wrestling match, and that will be the determining factor in this fight. My pick here is Kizriev via decision or sub, and I actually like him as a potential parlay piece. And the only reason why, though, is that while he was somewhat impressive against Kayo, just in that previous match against GM3, I mean... We, we need to look at what happened there. GM3 took this guy mm-hmm. down three times, uh, doing pretty good in the striking exchanges, and then GM3 found the sub, which was a rear naked choke. And Kizriev loves to attack those kind of chokes. So I could see something similar happening in there as well. So that's the reason why I think I'm leading that side. And I just wasn't too impressed by Muradov in his last victory either. I mean, I think that he should have finished Brian Barberina via sub. Especially he took him down like 13 times, so 
Yeah, I mean, but I do see your point about Kizria potentially not, you know, he's kind of unproven the UFC level so far. And in his last fight against Dennis Tolulu, and I mean, he was kind of getting pieced up. So we'll see what happens. But yeah, I think he's just going to bring out the wrestling shoes here and just take this guy down, try to sub him. Next fight that we have on the main card is going to be Viviana Arujo versus Natalia Silva. And this fight right here, it's going to be a potential coming out party for Silva. I think that uh, Vivi is actually trying to defend her rank here, if, if I'm not mistaken. I think she's still ranked in, in the UFC. Um, Vivi is 12 and 5. She is three, 2 and 3 in her last five. She's actually coming off of a decision victory over Jennifer Maya about two months ago. She's 37 years old, so. Bears a lot of uh, weight in this fight, especially in my opinion. Natalia Silva, she's 16 5 and 1. 5 known in her last 5. She's actually 4 known in the UFC, so she's been undefeated so far. She's coming off a decision victory over Andrea Lee. And the odds right now. So, Vivi, Natalia is actually minus 340, and she opened up at a minus 275. So, some dog action. It's not been taking too much. Uh, I think people are actually just going the other direction so far for Silva. I, know, I, I think Vivi is a, a decent fighter. She has this all round skill set there. I think that her striking is UFC level for the division. She has some pretty good strikes. Okay power just mainly rides on her quickness and quick hands. Able to attack with leg kicks as well. She's able to counter well as well. And she does get hit, though. That's the one thing that I, I don't like about her style. I mean, she tends to get into a lot of brawls, and that's uh, kind of unfortunate because I think that she is somewhat technical as a fighter. So she relies on her toughness and her chin, her grappling. I mean, 76% takedown defense is solid. Decent takedown accuracy as well, 46%. She lands about 1.83 takedowns per fight, and she has the ability to unleash ground and pound on top. Vivi's one negative aspect, and it's getting worse, especially as she ages, is her cardio. Um, I think especially now that she's 37, turning 38, if you saw that fight against Amanda uh, Rivas, she kind of gassed out in that fight. And in her last fight, although it was a win, I mean, it was a fighting against a similar age fighter, Jennifer Maya. So she's fighting up against uh, another prime kind of fighter, I guess Natalia Silva. And Natalia has taken the UFC by storm. I mean, she's 4 0 in her last uh, like four UFC bouts, just undefeated. Her striking, I think the movement and footwork is pretty high level in the cage. Powerful shots, KO capabilities, even later in fights. She's able to attack all three levels with the head, the body, and the legs. Her grappling is actually pretty underrated, too, in my opinion. I think that she's actually well versed in takedowns, likes to go for the trips and throws as opposed to shooting for takedowns. She has a 92% takedown defense. That's something that's really impressive because she actually fought Jasmine, Jasmine Vidicious. She stuffed all six of Jasmine's takedowns and actually took Jasmine down twice. So Jasmine's a high-level wrestler from Canada, and she just out-wrestled her, out-grappled her in that fight too and just piecing her up on the feet. I think that Silva has good top control and transition as well in grappling situations. For me, this is pretty cut and dry. I think that Silva will just outstrike and outgrapple Vivi for all three rounds. I like Silva by decision. I think she's a parlay piece. Over two and a half could be a potential play as well, but I'd rather just ride Silva in this case. What do you think about this fight between Silva and Vivi here? Yeah, so this is going to be high-level women's MMA, so I actually have a bet on this one. So Vivian Arrojo she she might have the submission threat possibly, but Natalia Silva, like you said, she's pretty well versed. I've seen in her past fights before UFC, she had a lot of arm bars, arm locks type of submissions herself. So yeah, she's she's pretty well rounded there as well. And Vivian Orojo, she is older and she does struggle against technical striking. And this might be a maybe the worst matchup for Vivian. 
in Natalia, she's she has smooth technical striking and she she looks good all around. And she from what I've seen, she hardly ever looks like she's losing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for me, Natalia Silva, the hype is most likely real and she's a parlay piece for me. Perfect, perfect. Well, yeah, let's the stuff her some parlays this week. <laughs> I yeah, I feel great about that too. N nothing um, like Mike Malott. <laughs> nah, nah, I don't want to. I don't want to think about that guy. <laughs> well, Scott. Um, yeah, I mean, it's great because I mean, Vivi, I mean, Natalia, you know, she has proven to actually win decisions so far, right, in the UFC. So I, I think we can bank on her gas tank at least, uh, unlike some, uh, unlike Mikey. <laughs> uh, Let's move on to, to the next fight here. So the next fight is going to be on the main card. Randy Brown versus Muslim Salikov. This is actually going to be a rebooking. I think they were supposed to fight at like UFC 296 or something like that. And now they're going to fight uh, here. Randy Brown, he's 17 to 5. He's actually 4 and 1 in his last five. And he's coming off a decision victory over Wellington Terman. Fighting against Muslim Salikov, 19-4, 3-2 in his last five, coming off of that decision loss against Nicholas Dalby. Odds for this fight right now. Randy Brown's a minus 250, and he opened up a minus 260. So not too much line movement either way. There was some slight underdog action on Muslim Salikov for a couple of weeks, but it's kind of staying in the same range. Gerard, what do you think about Randy Brown versus Muslim Salikov here? Randy Brown, he's going to be the younger fighter. And Salikov is, I think he's like 39 now. He's up there in age. Um, yeah, this one, I mean, Randy Brown should probably win. He's the longer, younger, and he he strike if he strikes from range, he should win this. but. The problem I see here for Randy is that he doesn't seem that dangerous. He's like kind of content to going to a decision. And that Wellington Terman fight was was not that great for me. That wasn't really a good look for me for Randy. And I don't know. If he fights like that against Muslim, uh Muslim Salikov, he can he can have some more damaging shots in the fight and maybe catch him with some kicks. Those low kicks will be hard on Randy. And I mean, I think Salikov has, can pull off an upset here, but he is 39 and yeah, I'm going to lean Randy Brown just, just cause of his, his age and, but I'm I'm not sold on Randy being able to get out in this one. But yeah, I'm I'm probably gonna stay away from this fight. Salikov can definitely upset in this one, I in my opinion. Yeah, I have similar vibes as you for this fight. I mean Randy's a actually think he's above average rank striker, he uses his length and reach pretty well to fight from the outside. Quick hands and kicks to keep his opponents at a distance. He just does not have uh, good power, though. I mean, only two KOs in the UFC. That's like 18% of his wins. He's mainly a decision fighter. 55% of his wins have come by decision. And he can snatch up an opportunistic sub every now and then. 27% of his wins are by sub. 39% takedown accuracy. 0.8 takedowns uh, landed per fight. So he uses more so like trips and throws than the standard double leg, single legs. You know, I, I think that Muslim is a solid Sanda Sanda style striker. He uses heavy shots, throws the heavy shots. He can get flashy at times and throw some fight ending spinning attacks. He's actually from Dagestan, but uh, you know he's he's able to wrestle opponents who are weak in grappling. But more so, he uses his wrestling grappling to mix things up. He doesn't have the best control time or submission skills. He's turning third. I mean, he's thirty forty, and he's thirty nine right now. So he showed a pretty bad gas tank for Stalvi's last fight, and the cardio most likely is not going to improve in his advanced age. However, Randy's last fight, like you 
brought up. I mean, I don't think that was impressive at all. He gassed out in the later rounds as well compared to his round one pace. So his gas tank also appears to be worsening as he's exiting his prime at age 33. Pick here will be Randy Brown by decision, but I'm staying away from this, the money line. I mean, I, I don't trust him enough in this matchup. I do wish that we still had the over one and a half because I, I remember that when this fight was initially um, scheduled, there was an over one and a half round line in most books, but now it's like over two and a half already. People are still uh, betting it, by the way. I mean, the, the over two and a half opened at plus 115, and it's been bet to minus 160 already. So a lot of people have a feeling this fight will probably go to decision, most likely. So, but yeah, I'm probably just going to stay away from it because I think that one and a half line, round line was much better value right now. Moving on to the next fight here. This is going to be the co-main event of the evening. We have Renato Moicano versus Drew Dover, Money Moicano himself, the Moicano Militia. <laughs> um, <laughs> Renato Moicano, he's 17-5-1. and one. Uh, He is uh, coming off pretty long layoff, if I remember. I think that the last time he fought was about like a year ago. So his last win was a submission victory over Brad Riddell, where you know he, he took over the mic and said, Moicano wants money, so... Mm-hmm. Been a long time since this guy's fought. I think he's coming off like a knee injury or something, right? So he's fighting against Drew Dober, 27 and 12, 4 and 1 his last five. Drew Dober is coming off a KO victory over Ricky Glenn. Both of these fighters are around the same age. I think you know, Drew is going to be slightly older, but Moicano is going to have the taller frame and the longer frame here. Odds for this fight right now. Renato is actually at minus 175, so he opened up at a plus 110 underdog. And people have been taking dog action on Moicano and even the favorite action on Moicano as well. Gerard, I'll let you open up this prediction for the co-main band of the evening. What do you think about Renato Moicano versus Drew Dober here? Renato Moicano, he's he's going to be the more well-rounded guy. I actually think that... Uh, he has underrated stand up and i think he can mix it up in this fight the one problem i do see is that it seems like he he doesn't have too much head movement and that that might be a a scary thing against drew dober who has one punch power but he also has a uh, mukan also has that submission ability the submission threat to mix up the grappling and even possibly get to the back of Drew Dober, get a rear naked choke. Um, I'm I'm pondering whether to play possibly Moicano sub by sub in this fight. I like Renato Moicano in this one, but it is still kind of scary up against Drew Dober. Who's very durable and has that one punch power with Moicano if Moicano just stays in front of him. But I think Moicano is, is smart enough. I mean, he we see him analyze his fights, um, Moicano militia, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure he knows the what he's up against against Drew Dober here. So yeah, my pick here is Renato Moicano. Uh, uh, probably a slight medium confidence on this one. And I may look to play some Moicano by sub. Yeah, Moicano by sub right now is plus 200. So uh, not too bad right there. Yeah, I mean, Moicano, quite the character. I actually really like him as a personality in the MMA scene. Uh, just going back to his fight skills, you know, technical striker, high level jujitsu skills. He does have some nice leg kicks. I think that's also a clean jab as well. So he is able to work in some quick combos based off of that. The bad thing about his striking though, is that he just has some chin issues. I mean, he's been knocked out in the UFC three times. And also he doesn't have that much power. He's zero KO wins in his career. So he really likes to go for those uh, subs. Now, his grappling 
it's actually a pretty high level. I think he has good jiu-jitsu skills. Top control is good. Transitions well in grappling exchanges. He's a really dangerous guy in submissions, though. I mean, he has 10 sub wins in his career, only one sub loss. Going back to Drew Dober, I mean, this guy's the crimson chin, fights, fights with some crazy fighting power. He likes to pressure forward and just bully, cut off the cage, and angles pretty well. He has a high volume, just bully style. So he eats strikes and takes it on his crimson chin, right? That's his whole game plan. He just eats those strikes, takes it, and then dishes out some fight ending KOs. Now, this strategy doesn't work out all the time. I mean, if you look at his last fight against, uh, you know, Matt Frivola, right? His last loss, uh, it got cracked. So the chin, it is possible to crack that chin, but I mean, fat, I mean, the Matt Frivola, he's like, a truly uh, the steamroller. I mean, he has the power himself, so uh, I don't think Moikano has that type of power. I think that Drew Dover does have some grappling. Um, he has okay grappling skills. He likes to keep it on the feet, though. 56% takedown defense, so about average. Not too bad, but not the greatest either. He does like to just work his way up, back up. Half of his losses are by sub, so in the UFC at least. He has four sub losses already. I, I believe that Moikano will be able to take Drew down and eventually grind him out for a submission. The only hesitation here is that Moikano is coming off an injury and has not fought in a year. So we just have no idea what this guy might look like. Maybe he's going to be better, could be worse, but that there is going to be some volatility in that because he has been inactive and he's coming off an injury. So I just want to point that out. He also has proven chin issues, and that's a bad recipe against a guy like Drew Dober. So pick here is Moicano by sub. I'm going to wait until the weigh-ins to decide whether to play this or not because I, I need to see what Moicano looks like. Obviously, Drew Dober as well, just to see how both of them look like. If Moicano looks good, he could be a potential parlay piece. But I, I think I'm just going to play it safe and probably hold off and see how the fight plays out because there's just way too many variables for me to be able to see if he's actually a parlay piece or not. Also, you know, he's been spending a lot of time on social media. Uh, maybe it's because he's been injured. You know, he's, he's, mm -hmm. he's been building a pretty good brand on his um, social media. So spending a lot of time on that. Is he training? I don't know. Um, but well, I think that this will be a fight where I have to wait and see rather than try to play him. So that's going to be my pick there. Moving on to the main event of the evening. We have Roman Delice versus Nazardine Imlov. Roman Delice, he is 12 and 2. He is 4 and 1 in his last five. He's coming off of that decision loss to Marvin Vittori. Nazardine Imlov, 12 and 4. He is 3 1 and 1 in his last five. And he's actually coming off that kind of no contest uh, against Chris Curtis. He was thoroughly. Dominating Chris Curtis in that fight, though. Just wanted to point that out before he... Uh, I think they had a headbutt, right? So um, mm -hmm. that's why the, that fight got no contest. Um, Nazardine will be the younger fighter here by about eight years, 35 years old. Roman compared to Nazardine, 27 years old. And uh, they're both around the same size. 6'3", 6'2", 75-inch reach, 76-inch reach. Nazardine right now is a minus 161 favorite. And he opened up at minus 130. So not too much line movements happened there. Some people are just going with Nazardine as the favorite. I mean, I think that Roman is a good grappler. He has legit power in his shots. Decent jab and straight. He's not that quick, though, or fast. So he's kind of a, more of a plotter, if you will. Uh, I think that he has basic striking skills, not the most dynamic. His grappling is where all of his dynamic abilities come from, though. I think he's a really good submission specialist, has a wide variety of subs in his back pocket. He's able to sweep, reverse, transition really well in grappling. If you see his wins against Phil Halls and Jack Hermanson, able to just instantly change positions and kind of go into a fight ending position for himself. So this guy is really well versed in grappling situations. Imavov Kickboxer who fights with his hands low, kind of have a side to side kind of stance. He has pretty good footwork for a middleweight his size. He likes to move in and out, pop his opponents, good accurate counters. I think that he is susceptible to power shots because he does keep his hands low. 
So that could be uh, something that we need to think about for this fight. His grappling is just okay. He more so takes advantage of weak grapplers or when he has like a massive size advantage, especially against a guy like Joaquin Buckley or Edmund Shabazian. He can't be controlled on the ground and taken down by higher level wrestler grapplers. Just go and look back at his uh, decision loss to Phil Halls. Phil Halls was taking him down and controlling him. This will be a fight one. I mean, I think this will be a tough one to predict. Um, Roman's able to... If Roman's able to commit to his grappling and shoot for takedowns, he may be able to ground Imbavov and win by controlling him or by sub. I lean towards Imbavov being able to sprawl and brawl his way to a victory, finding perhaps a late KO or decision victory. Pick here is Imbavov by KO or decision. But I'm probably staying away from this fight because I can easily see Roman catching this guy, especially if Bob keeping his hand low and Roman catching this guy with his power. Or somehow they both get into grappling exchanges and at that point, Roman's the much better grappler, in my opinion. Gerard, what do you think about this main event between Imavov and Delice here? Yeah, so Delice, he has, yeah, he has real power. And he's a more dynamic jujitsu fighter, in my opinion. And yeah, this is this is gonna be interesting. This is gonna be five rounds, so we don't know how Dulitse will be in a five round fight if it gets past the second and the third. So it, it'll probably go in favor to Imavov in a five rounder. And Imavov is probably is the quicker fighter. He's more light on his feet, technical striking. Um, possibly looking at the over two and a half in this one, but yeah, that's the only possible bet that I'm looking at here. I think Imovav will win, but maybe the two over two and a half is what I'm more leaning to in this one. Uh, the lead say he this is gonna be kind of yeah kind of scary because <laughs> because just because of the power and the if it gets into a grappling situation and the lead say actually uses his wrestling it, it could get scary to imovov getting possibly subbed but i mean imovov is also well-rounded uh himself so yeah, I can see how this could this could be a a fight pretty hard to predict. But I can also see a path where Imovov could just be piecing up the Lidze for five rounds as well. So I see why he he's the favorite here. But overall, I think if I were to bet on this fight, I would just be more leaning to the over two and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Not a bad play. I actually uh, kind of like the over two and a half. Awesome. Well, that wraps up the predictions and breakdowns for this fight card between Delete Say and Imavov coming up this Saturday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. We'll come out with the best bet videos hopefully later on uh, today or later on this week. I think all the props have dropped. So now it's a good time to uh, you know attack those props, if you will. Do you already have any other last thoughts on the card or anything overall before we hop off? I think that uh, for this card, I can see, like like Kevin says, this card might be like uh, cl- a lot of close fights and possibly upsets. So mm-hmm. in a card like this, you might uh, put like one unit on all the dogs, maybe, and then come out positive, but... <laughs> That that's something that is to look at on this card. There could be a lot of close fights in this one. Yeah, I mean, I right when I looked at this card, and I feel like I saw a lot of overs that I wanted to attack. So I, I think that this will be a lot of the judges' score cards, um, and of course, maybe there's going to be a lot of finishes since I said that. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, yeah, either way, uh, you know, a lot of fights on the UFC, so we're coming off of a uh, break in the UFC, and I think a lot of people are going to be hungry to watch some of these fights. So that about does it for Pure Picks. Once again, best of luck, everybody. Hope everybody makes profit. 
and we'll be back soon.